Hey everyone, it's Darren DeVivo. Welcome to Things We Said Today, a Beatle podcast about the Beatles together and apart. Everything having to do with the Beatles. Apple Records, the Solo Years, Wings, Plastic Ono Band, Yoko Ono, you name it. Uh, this is the podcast for you if you're a fan. Um, I'm Darren DeVivo, as I pointed out. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. Uh, which is at 90.7 FM and WFUV.org on the air five days a week, Monday night through Thursday nights, late night and Saturday afternoons. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. And uh, as is the case, each show, which is roughly every other week, is what we try to stick to. Uh, I'm joined by my good friends uh, as Beatle fans and in real life, Ken Michaels, uh, an original host of the show, Ken, uh, is the host of Every Little Thing, a radio program which is syndicated at uh, more than 50 broadcast outlets, uh, most of them internet radio. And uh, in addition to Every Little Thing, you can catch Ken Michaels on YouTube, uh, on Ken Michaels Radio, his YouTube channel, which is chock full of interviews and all kinds of other uh, shenanigans. Ken's uh, got uh, 40 plus years in broadcasting, and it uh, gives me pleasure to welcome. I don't welcome him. He's here every week. Say hello again to Ken Michaels. Hello <laughs> again, Ken. Hi, Darren. And hi, Alan. Hi to all of you. Great to be back. And you know Alan Cozen, because Alan is, along with Adrian Sinclair, in the process of documenting uh, the life and times of Paul McCartney post Beatles. Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair have already published the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. And on December 10th this year comes the McCartney Legacy Volume 2. And you see them there. Well, for me, it's to Alan's left. Um, but I might be backwards. Well, I am, but that's a discussion for another time. But the blue one, the blue book, as it'll become known, is the brand new one coming on, October, on uh, December 10th. And uh, the red one is volume one, which has been out now and continues to be available and hopefully always will be on hardcover. And Alan's got some 40 odd years as a journalist, a writer, author, um, significant period of time at the New York Times, um, expert in classical music field and Beatles, obviously. And he's with us for every show because he's a host. And why wouldn't he be here? Here's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. How are you? Good. It can. Uh, and today's show, we are going to talk about uh, two things. One thing that, unfortunately, I did not get to participate in. We're going to talk about Ringo Starr's All-Star Band Tour, which is now, unfortunately, came to an early end. I'm sure you know the deal, but we'll get to that in a moment. Plus, the Paul McCartney and Wings film, One Hand Clapping. Uh, but that's ahead after we take a look at news and a listen at news Beatle News with Ken Michaels. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Uh, got quite a bit of news to get to here. And as you just mentioned, Darren, Ringo Starr had to cancel the last two shows from his tour with his all-star band due to illness. Ringo had a cold and, according to one source, had lost his voice. His doctor recommended resting it out. And therefore, his show in Philadelphia at the TD Pavilion at the Man and in New York City for Radio City Music Hall, both those shows were canceled. They are saying these two dates will not be rescheduled and that all ticket holders will be getting a refund. So obviously we'll send get well wishes to Ringo and hope for a speedy recovery. Sad way to end. Uh, mm. And hopefully he'll be back next year. Well, that depends upon, uh, he certainly loves these musicians that he has in this band has to deal with their availability before he can book any time with them. Lately, he's been doing two two tours a year, a spring tour and a fall tour, and each one's two to three weeks long. So hopefully there'll be another one next year. And remember, we did hear uh, from a press release that we should be expecting news in October about Ringo's new album, not EP, new album of country music. So we're looking forward to hearing whatever details we can on that we announced it on our last things we said today's show the day before the official announcement 
But it will be happening, and that's Capitol Records' vinyl box set called The Beatles 1964 U.S. Albums in Mono. It includes the seven albums, Meet the Beatles, The Beatles' second album, A Hard Day's Night, Something New, Beatles 65, The Early Beatles, and The Beatles Story. All the albums will be made uh, individually, except for The Beatles Story, uh, which you can only get in the box. They have been asking, I mean, sorry, they've been uh, analog cut for 180 gram vinyl from their original mono master tapes all seven albums will feature faithfully replicated artwork plus four panel inserts with essays from bruce spicer and the release date for that is november the 22nd okay um talk about the power of the beatles music their new song from last year, Now and Then, just surpassed 58 million views on YouTube. November 3rd will mark the one-year anniversary for the song. Let's hope it makes it to 60 million by then. The song has been averaging 5 million views per month. Quite remarkable. Remember, that's only the video. That's not even counting all the audio streams that the song has gotten in the past year. And also, in celebration of its 50th anniversary... Really, it's 51. Uh, <laughs> George Harrison's Living in the Material World, Dark Horse Records, and BMG will be celebrating with a suite of new releases, including a new mix of the album from Grammy Award winner Paul Hicks. The Super Deluxe Edition album contains two CDs, one for the remix, the other for outtakes of every song, plus two LPs, a Blu-ray of Dolby Atmos for all the audio, a 60-page booklet with extensive sleeve notes, photography, and artwork from the Harrison Archive, as well as a seven-inch single of the previously un unheard recording of Sunshine Life from Me, Sail Away Raymond, which, of course, Ringo recorded for the Ringo album, and George Harrison wrote it featuring members of the band on that song alongside Ringo. Also, it will be available as both a 2LP and 2CD Deluxe Edition. The 2LP version will come in a gatefold sleeve with a 12-page booklet. The 2CD Deluxe Edition comes in a clamshell box with two printed wallets and a 20-page booklet plus a poster. The main album will also be available as 1LP and 1CD as well um and uh there's also there'll also be a limited edition one lp color vinyl exclusives available from the official george harrison online store for that there'll be a purple color vinyl from amazon they're making one that is a clear color vinyl and barnes and noble have an orange color vinyl all formats are available for pre-order now and in advance of its release take 18 of give me love give me peace on earth has been available on streaming platforms for more information you can visit the website materialworldfoundation.com what do you think guys excited about this oh yeah i am i just wish it wasn't coming out within a week of uh the beetle box set it's yeah. you know and i'm actually a little surprised that they do that that they've uh, released them so close you know, to one another. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of money. Yeah. But uh, no, I'm thrilled with it. And what what's the deal with, now you said the uh, purple vinyl is being sold by George's online store. Right. Amazon. Orange at Barnes & Noble. Orange is Barnes & Noble. Clear color is Amazon. There's is also like a whitish, creamy, or is that the clear one? I'm not Might sure. Be more, Did you more hear of a cream color i thought i did there's apparently but, a blue vinyl version of the beatles uh mono set at Target. okay didn't know about that <laughs> i get part of my news from the from the two of you <laughs> yeah what now the because i think i ordered the beat one one of the beetle albums is on colored vinyl i don't know about that there's an exclusive uh, let me let me see if I could find out something about that because now you, well, what would what would a show be without releases coming out and Darren being confused about all the things? But uh, I should write everything down that I see. But uh, anyway, as you are, continue. I'll look this up. Okay. Well, I'm I'm obviously excited, being that it's my yeah. favorite time. Right. 
I just wish that there was more than the one disc of outtakes. I mean, that's what I go to immediately. And that's it. Obviously, there was a lot more with All Things Must Pass being a, a double album and everything. But it just goes to show you, and I find it really fascinating how the Lennons and the McCartneys and the Harrisons handle their box sets completely differently. Right. The Lennons give you so much bang for your buck and different mixes, elemental mixes, elements mixes, um, you know, uh, the evolutionary mixes, all of that and outtakes plus a remix of the entire album with uh, with George. It's a remix of the album and one disc of outtakes. And um, yeah, I, I'd be happy if every George Harrison solo album was treated this way. I'd love to have one disc of outtakes for every single album would be nice. But there is an outtake for every single song from uh, Living in the Material World. And I'm looking forward to that. I do like Take 18 of Give Me Love. Sounds exactly the same with backing tracks wise it's just different uh lead vocals from george but uh and it sounds great sound quality wise ding oh. ding 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 found yeah. one bit of information uh target is putting out and i've ordered it a, a colored vinyl edition of meet the beatles okay it does not say here though the color but it is uh i believe it's a um it's just Meet the Beatles. As far as I know, Target's doing a Meet the Beatles colored or special edition. Okay. And that is due, I guess, around the same time as the box set. Right. That's that's okay. that's the Beatles and the George uh I can't easily find. So we'll, later on maybe I'll mention something if I see it. Okay. And also for the collector, Ringo Starr's albums for Stop and Smell the Roses and Old Wave will be coming out on picture disc and that's on november 15th the exact same time all right i also want to mention and i want to stress this folks it's a rumor this has not been officially announced but sometimes if you don't say these things you feel foolish if you know if it happens to be true and you find out this information right before it's about to be announced but there's been some talk online about paul mccartney releasing a new album on October the 14th called The Seven Line. I haven't heard a statement from Paul to confirm it. I haven't heard anything from his publicity team at all. Um, it's on Steve Hoffman's board already hearing about this. I have heard that the legendary singer Lulu, as known for To Sir With Love, the big hit with that, uh, who's been friends with Paul for a long time, uh since the 60s uh she said that she's contributing backing vocals for his new album but um i know on hoffman's board they're, they're kind of saying it's probably a 2025 release but we don't know for sure but word is circulating out there so just want to make just the seven line because that's a name of a fan group for the new york mets and i'm wondering about Possibly the name somehow getting through social media circles mixed up, and because I wonder what the title would mean for a McCartney album. I don't know, but I was thinking of the subway line myself. But uh, we do know, for those of you who are not New Yorkers, Paul made a video for Flaming Pie Night when the album came out, which was shown on the screen yeah. at Shea Stadium at the time. I was there, and I don't remember it. You were there that night and you don't remember? I went to Flaming Pie Night. I heard about it like the day before or something. I bought two tickets. Uh, I was at that game and it was really, they were playing Beatles and Solo Paul between innings. I don't remember more than that. Oh, just a cool little minute, two minute video that he prepared for it. But then Paul went and became a Yankee fan, started rooting for <laughs> them. They were hot. It's, you know, flavor of the month. <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, according to the bbc <laughs> according to the bbc back in august the famous jacaranda club where the beatles played was honored with a green commemorative plaque the group played there with original bass guitarist Stu sutcliffe and original drummer pete best in august of 1960 the world origin site plaque acknowledges the hidden gem where the beatles cut their teeth before their breakthrough Hamburg tour. Graham Stanley, the director of the Jacaranda, said the World Origin site status was an amazing privilege 
And he went on to say, we have always been proud of our Beatles heritage, but we haven't had a clear way to explain it until now. It probably wasn't a big gig for the band. Their name and reputation were really made during the Hamburg tour, which began just days later. But our venue is where they adopted the most famous band name in history. Thank you to Fred Velez for contributing that for our show. The new documentary called Daytime Revolution about the week when John and Yoko co-hosted the Mike Douglas show in 1972 will have its theatrical showing on John's birthday on October 9th. And now I'm hearing it'll be coming out on DVD and Blu-ray on November 26th. All these releases in November. Um, the new movie on Brian Epstein, Midas Man, which I was told would be shown in movie theaters October 10th. I'm now not certain about that. Still might be true, but I've also heard it will be coming to Amazon Prime Video, and that'll be on October the 30th. And as long as I have it here in front of me, it just came out a few days ago. This is the brand new coffee table size mind games book oh i forgot about that yeah just came out i also want to thank one of our listeners bob tavares who mailed me a copy of this wonderful issue of uncut magazine with a lot in there on the mind games album it also comes with this booklet where they review every john lennon album in there and a cd sampler of songs from the mind games box set thank you bob for sending me that Got a lot of reading to do between Uncut and the coffee table size book. Um, news about uh, Elliot Mintz's book. Well, that, another book on John. It's called Instant Karma, John. Uh, Instant Karma, John, Yoko, and Me. And that comes out October 22nd. So not everything is November. Um, news about the Beatles Sons. Julian Lennon's new photo book called Life's Fragile Moments. Originally was going to be released September 9th. Now it's being delayed until December 3rd. And another new song from James McCartney. He just keeps trickling one new song out after another. One song a month. The new one's called I'm Yours, which you can listen to on YouTube. And it is another song that he wrote with Sean Lennon. Getting a great yeah. action on, on YouTube. Brute Force whose real name is Stephen Friedland, best known for his single with Apple Records, King of Fa. We'll be giving a concert and a Q&A with our colleague Ken Womack. That will be at the Wood Theater at Monmouth University in New Jersey on December 2nd at 4.30 p.m. Uh, there is a new Beatles documentary running for just two days at the Walter Reed Theater at Lincoln Center in New York City, September 30th and October 1st. So sorry that we're doing this show so close to those two dates. Uh, it has the best title ever for a Beatles film. It's called Things We Said Today. Oh. And um, it concerns August of 1965, as the Beatles were about to perform their legendary first concert at Shea Stadium. The documentary is made up entirely of archival material from news stations broadcast to personal 8 millimeter diaries. It's being made by Romanian filmmaker Andre Ujica, U-J-I-C-K. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. The film is also described as a work of imagination using superimposed animated drawings and descriptive voiceovers. Um, and that will be to memorialize this vanished moment in history. I wouldn't call it vanished. With poignant, distinctive flair. Those two days for the screening of the film are for standby only, September 30th and October 1st. No word about any future release for this as of yet. Big thank you to Kyle Hand for telling me all about this. Another one of our of our listeners. I want everyone to know that we try to put a kind of flair into this show. So it's not just the things we said today, film. We have a distinctive flair on this thing, as we said today. Well, just having you on the show is enough flair for anybody. There you go. That's a flair. <laughs> That's a lot of things. I also want to say on the recent episode of Talk More Talk, my other podcast show, 
Um, it was a treat to interview session players David Spinoza and Kenny Asher, both of whom played on John Lennon's Mind Games album. Kenny was also on John's Walls and Bridges and Rock and Roll albums. David Spinoza was on Paul and Linda's Ram and Ringo's Ringo the Fourth. David announced on that show that he'll, he will have a special big band show performing all Beatles music. And we now have a date for that. It's November 17th at the Cutting Room in New York City. Oh. It will be at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And Kenny Asher will be in the band. So if you're a big fan of the Mind Games album or the work of those two gentlemen, big date right there. November 17th at the Cutting Room in New York City uh, at 1 p.m. Incidentally, you can also uh, catch Kenny Asher performing every Friday from 5.30 to 7 p.m. in New York City at the Birdland Jazz Club. Jazz is a big oh. is. He also loves big band music as well. So that's every Friday, anytime you want to see him. I did not know that. Okay. And uh, I do believe that is all the news. That should be enough, I think. What are you munching on, Darren? I'm sorry, the snacks are here. Okay. <laughs> that's why I need us. <laughs> that's why I need to like lose weight and I'm in PT because I eat anything that's in front of me. Now I'm gonna find oh. out that those are bits of pencils I've been eating. Here's one thing. This is quite an oversight. <laughs> I'm glad I wrote it down. Paul's tour starts in two days. Uh. He's gonna be in Uruguay to kick off the tour so we're going to be hearing in a few days what the set list is if there's any changes whatsoever from <laughs> the last tour he's performing the seven line in its entirety <laughs> and one time only so you have to be there for that in uruguay <laughs> so that's it darren okay you know what I didn't mention before, and I do apologize. When I introduced you, Ken, I got to mention that your co-host talk more talk. I mentioned the the every little thing, and uh, Ken Michaels radio. So I know I'm sure um, Joe Mayo and Kiddo Tool are mad at me now, but I didn't mean to. Yeah, I'll I'll calm them down. In any event, uh, today's show um, was going to be and is a kind of a two parter. Our review our thoughts on a uh Ringo Starr and his all-star band's 2024 tour uh and b the Paul McCartney and Wings now it can be referred to as concert film one hand clapping in theaters um as for Ringo unfortunately as Ken told you Ringo canceled his show in Philadelphia and in New York City at Radio City Music Hall and I was going to see the Radio City Music Hall show, the final show of the tour, which it did not get past me that it's his last show of this tour. And where my mind goes, I'm thinking, might it be Ringo's last show? I hope not. I'm sorry, you know, but uh, so I was stunned. This was the day before. It was the afternoon of the Philadelphia show when the announcement came down. I did reach out. To Ringo's people, which I didn't mention anything to you guys before, just to send my well wishes and got a response that, yeah, it's a cold, although it was sort of a, you know, there's so much going around today. It's not COVID, but, you know, but it was a cold and they thanked me for my kind thoughts. And there really hasn't been any follow up on that. But while I didn't get to see Ringo and uh, I don't know, Alan did, 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 didn't come through. Ken did. And in fact, Ken in Connecticut probably saw one of the last shows then of that tour, right? Or was it the last one? I'm not sure if it was the last one. It's one of the last, you know. And so where uh, tell us about the show and um, where did where did you see it in Connecticut? Mohegan Sun Casino, where I see many concerts and I've seen Ringo there several times. Right. And it's it's pretty much the same show he's been doing for the last few years with the same lineup, except that. Edgar Winter wasn't with him, and Edgar wasn't there for the spring tour, from what I had heard, even though I don't even think Ringo's team put out the statement, I had heard that Edgar had COVID at the time. I don't know why he wasn't included on the fall tour. 
Um, but the band was cooking on all cylinders. This is a band that's that's been together the same lineup minus Edgar Winter for several years now. With Steve Lukather, who's been with him since 2012. That's a long time to be in the band with, with Ringo. And also Colin Hay and Hamish Stewart and Greg Bissonette. And Warren Ham, who is really, you know, the Mark Rivera of, of the team these days, playing a whole variety of instruments, and he's been their musical director. Um, and it's the same set list of songs. The other members get to do three songs each, and it's always the same three songs. And at at this point, and I can't speak for everybody because I've seen Ringo so many times and I've been to every single tour lineup that he's had. It's always an enjoyable show. I do wish that he would change the set list. I do wish he would occasionally change, um, you know, the, the personnel. What made it fascinating and a lot of fun in the early years was every single year, some members would go and you get some new members in there and they shake it up and you got a different set list and um, but these days for me, because I know the set list and I know exactly what they're going to play and I know that they play well, th these guys can do this show in their sleep, you know, um, I look at the interaction most of all on stage to see if Ringo is having fun, if he's enjoying himself, um, when he looks at the other members, is he smiling? Is he having a good time? Especially when he looks over to Greg Bissonette when they're both double drumming. At the same time, I enjoyed the show from that aspect of it. And also, uh, I should say that with Edgar Winter not there, um, they had another musician, Buck Johnson, who's been performing with Aerosmith for a while, and he was on keyboards. I was actually all the way, almost 90 degrees <laughs> from the stage to the left. And I could zero look right down at Buck and his playing on the keyboards. And he was doing a lot of work and I could hear his playing, which was really mixed well with, with the band. And um, seeing the camaraderie. You know, this is also a lineup that you think maybe they're tired of doing this. It's the same lineup. It's the same songs. And yet I think they just enjoy each other's company so much. And they know what an honor it is to be in a band with Ringo. And that's why they stick it out and do the same tour every year and it's also a big kick for me now and i can apply this to ringo paul a lot of veteran artists to see young people in the audience and to see how they're reacting and there's a lot of camera shots of young people or parents and their kids and i get a big thrill out of seeing them and when ringo's doing uh any beatles material there was a young couple in front of me that was thrilled when it was the end of the show and Ringo did with a little help from my friends and the guy was so, thrilled. you know, it's like he was in shock that Ringo was going to do with little help from my friends. Like, how can he not do with little help from my friends? But you know that so many people who go to these concerts are going there for the first time. It's not for, you know, the diehards and the hardcore fans like us. And so I enjoy seeing that. And I enjoy seeing young fans getting into Ringo doing the Beatles songs and his solo material. Um, and I know I commented the last time that I wish that Ringo would do some of his newer material or anything. He doesn't do anything past 1973. He does photograph. He does I'm the Greatest from, from the Ringo album. Um, and there's so much great material that I wish he would do, but Ringo is not what that's all about. He's there to entertain everybody. He doesn't want to see people getting out of their seats if they don't know a song. Although, let's face it, unless you have, well, I'm the Greatest has been in every Ringo compilation anyway. But it, it wasn't a single, and it wasn't a hit. And I'm sure there's some people out there that didn't know I'm the Greatest. But the mere fact that Ringo said, my friend John wrote this song, and he felt he couldn't release it himself, but it would be fine for me. People are going to stay there and listen to that. And it's also... It's a lot of fun to see the crowd react to all the other songs from the other band members. A lot of people don't know who Colin Hay is, but they know Men at Work, you know, and they get mm -hmm. up whenever, whenever um, he's doing Down Under and uh, certainly who can it be now towards the end. It's a great show. This band was on fire. Uh, the playing is just so good. I love listening to Hamish Stewart and, and the great bass playing that he does. Colin Hayes' voice is still very strong. It's not that easy to sing 
a lot of his songs that are in such a high register. When it comes to the Toto stuff with Steve Lukather, it's pretty much the same thing where Steve sings most of the song and the higher parts he lets Warren Ham sing. You know, it's, uh, it's been that way for, for quite a while. And Warren Ham's got a really strong voice. You got to mm -hmm. give Warren Ham a lot of credit because he bounces around to so many different instruments. You know, he plays percussion one minute. He plays flute the next. Certainly on a song like like Down Under, you need a flute player in there. Um, so he's he's just so valuable to the band with all that he does. And um, it's just a great show. I, I do also think that in addition to, well, this is, I hate being critical because, you know, we're at a stage where Paul and Ringo don't owe us anything. I'm happy that Ringo is alive and uh, and doing this. But without having Edgar Winter there, there were no songs to substitute the songs that Edgar would do. So it was a shorter show. Really? I thought that the other artists, the other bandmates might add on a fourth. No. no. Hmm. They all got to do three songs a piece. And I do remember towards the end of the show when Ringo does the final encore, it used to be act naturally photograph with little Huff, my friends he didn't do act naturally so it's just two songs at the very end but hmm. still judging by the crowd they loved it you know it's oh, yeah in most cases it's one hit after another and hopefully everybody in the audience knows all these songs ringo used to say songs you know and love um and it's it's such an enjoyable show it's formula at this point you know there really are no surprises especially if you've been to Ringo shows, um, you know, uh, I wish that he would change his set list. I wish that he would put in some new members. That's entirely up to him. I'm going to support him no matter what he does. Um, but I, I think in that case, that's more of a, the band is gelled so well. Yeah. Uh, that I think part of the reason why the band doesn't change is because Ringo really likes playing with this band. He found a combination. Uh, well, while the concept of the band was always to change. Right. But now he found this combination of musicians um, that also had included Greg Raleigh and Todd Rundgren. Uh, and even Richard Page, I guess, was the beginnings yep. of this period that why change? You know, I enjoy playing with these people. We gel well. You know that Ringo and Steve look at their developed a re relationship because Steve's playing on Ringo's material. Um, and Colin will write a song. You know, there's, there's, there's um, intermingling outside of the All Star Band, so they they must really have uh, clicked on a formula, not a formula, uh, a relationship uh, that uh, that uh, they value, so they stick with it. And you know, the people going to see Ringo Starr, well, I don't think should have a problem with that. I mean, the right. only thing yeah. to point to raise, I think, is that if he found a band that he likes working with and he's been working with, say, uh, Lukather for 12 years now, um, why doesn't he use this band to work up some new material, record with them like a real group, and then perform the new stuff that this group is doing on tour? Right. And as I've said many times, it's now reached a point where Steve Lukather has not only played on a lot of Ringo's albums and EPs, but he's written songs with Ringo, including We're On The Road Again. And what a perfect song for them to do on the road. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you mentioned Colin Hay. He wrote the song What's My Name? Mm -hmm. What does Ringo say at every single show? He shouts, oh, yeah. my name. you know, why can't they do that? So you know, and, and you raise a good point, Darren, and I do think that Ringo has said words to the effect. He said this is his favorite band. Well, he was saying that when Todd was with him. But it was, you know, I know he loves Todd Rundgren a lot. But uh, I'm sure he loved Greg Raleigh and, and uh, Richard Page as well. But these guys get along really well together. And I think that that matters a lot to him. There's no ego problems or anything getting in the way. So um, he's comfortable with this. And he seems to sell out. Every show I've been to is the only seats that remain are single seats. So he must be doing something right. 
So if you still haven't seen Ringo live, do it. <laughs> Don't ever take this for granted. It's mm. it's no matter what, it's an enjoyable show. Yeah. Yeah, and I was disappointed, but of course, more important that he's well, that I couldn't get to see the Radio City show. Um, what was funny was that I was, um, uh, everyone who watches the show regularly knows, you know, what a big Mets fan I am, and Ken is as well. Um, and I was like thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute now, the Mets have the playoffs and their sites were at the last week of the season. And I have the Ringo tickets and I have the tickets to one hand clapping and, and I don't want to miss any of these big Met games that are. Um, yeah. So I was actually, uh, if you follow baseball or know what's, you know, so some of the things going on current event wise, uh, you know, the South just got blasted by a hurricane and uh, it was going to affect Atlanta. Um, and the Mets and the Braves were playing in Atlanta. So there was all kinds of talk about major league baseball, should cancel, not cancel, reschedule or postpone or move these games and try not to affect the schedule. They ultimately did the worst possible thing and they rained out two games in a row and there's going to be a double header now on Monday. But um, and that's the a day off after the season's over. Um, but before that decision was made, I was anticipating uh, a rain out Wednesday night, which. I got, but while I periodically am checking online, I didn't anticipate getting an email that Ringo Starr has canceled his his shows, last yeah. two shows of the tour. So I think I sat in front of my computer with my jaw open for like five minutes in disbelief. Uh, and then like, oh no, that of course I go to the worst, why is he canceling two shows? Hmm. Um, and you hear cold and you can't help but think in this day and age. I hope it's not more than that. Right. Um, but from what I was told, no, it's a cold or something like a cold. And, you know, I didn't know about his voice, though. So that would really make sense then why he had no choice. Yeah. To cancel if he can't sing. And a cold could develop into something worse. Plus, he's 84 years old. You don't just take it lightly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, just like you, I had tickets for Radio City as well. I, I first got tickets oh, okay. for Radio City because I wasn't sure I was going to be vacationing in South Carolina. Not a good time to be vacationing yeah. in mm -hmm. South Carolina. But I canceled that, and then I got tickets for Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. So I'm very lucky that I got tickets for that. Yeah. But I think a lot of people, because of the proximity to most of us, we wanted to see in New York City – First of all, it's Radio City Music Hall. So it's yeah. a big landmark and it's the last show of the tour. And you're thinking, well, there might be some special guests arriving. Yeah. You know who it might be. If it's going to be anywhere, you'd think it would be at Radio City. So, um, yeah, I definitely wanted to see that show. But, you know, I've been spoiled having gone to every tour of his. So mm -hmm. um, just want Ringo healthy. Absolutely. And get well soon, Ringo, if you happen to be watching. Uh, and we know the last time I did something like that, we ended up having uh, you know, Peter Jackson back on. So, Peter, I hope you're doing well, too. Uh, <laughs> we say hi here in the States. Um, which brings us, I guess, now to the uh, next um, topic, and that is one hand clapping. Um, and, Alan, uh, this is I'm really looking forward to when volume two of uh, McCartney Legacy comes out. I'm really looking forward to reading about this 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 period in 1974, the Jeff Britton year. Uh, Jeff was the only, but I guess it was roughly a year, maybe slightly less than a year. Jeff was in the band, and this was as a result of that the kind of like the least heard, the least recognized lineup of Wings. And maybe I should let you talk because you've done you know, all the research, set up what one hand clapping was going to be. And okay. uh, coming after re after rehearsals and sessions in Nashville, right. which they spent six weeks there. Yeah, I find it interesting that they spent six weeks in Nashville and came out of it with a couple of songs. <laughs> and then they do it again, do something again in Abbey Road. So explain that whole period. 
that came out with uh that came back with Junior's Farm, Sally G, uh Bridge Over the River Suite, Walking in the Park with Eloise. And uh they had worked on some other tracks Paul had had brought over uh to, you know, just to do some overdubbing on. And uh yeah, so and I mean Bridge of the River Over the River Suite was one of those. It, it originally was mood music, I think it was called from uh Red Rose Speedway. It was an outtake. Um anyway, uh yeah, so they had gone to Nashville to sort of you know, play in the new guys, which were Jeff and uh, Jimmy McCulloch. And that was moderately successful. I mean, the, there was a lot of friction going on between various of the band members. Um, and, and partly, you know, Jeff, I think we talked about this before, Jeff was the odd man out because for one thing, he was a teetotaler and the rest of them were... Um, when I say the rest of them, I really just mean Denny and um, Jimmy, particularly, because Paul and Linda were sort of their own self-enclosed unit. And obviously they did a lot of smoking, but they didn't go out and carouse, you know, nights with the rest of the band. Uh, Jeff, Jimmy and Denny often went out and. Um, Jeff isn't drinking, isn't smoking, doing any drugs. Um, and as I think he put it in, I don't know if we use the quote or not, but uh, you, you would think that the other two would really appreciate that because they always had a designated driver, right? <laughs> um, but in fact, it kind of it kind of caused a lot of tension. And the fact that the, one of the reasons that Jeff was a teetotaler is because he was really into karate and um, he would turn up at, rehearsals etc in wearing his gi you know the karate kind of outfit you see it in one hand clapping he he does a bunch of karate moves and uh, and he's wearing it um but anyway so there was some tension there there was tension with you know between jimmy and linda you know jimmy had quickly inherited Henry McCulloch's, uh, you know, criticism of Linda as a player and brought it up in rehearsals, which, you know, caused some tension. Um, by the time they came back from Nashville, Paul had mentioned at least a couple of times to Jeff, and he has this in his diary, so these are comments from the time that he was just thinking of breaking up the band. You know, but what he wanted to do was see how it would work in the studio in Abbey Road and also get someone to film it so that he could look at the band at work. Um, although it's a little odd because it's not as if they set up as if they were on stage and filmed it. You know, you still see Jeff in his drum cubicle. Um, and there were, you know, they're set up more in a studio setup than than what they would have in a live setup, which is partly what Paul wanted to see this for, you know, because he wanted to eventually get them on tour. Um, so he hired David Litchfield, and it's really interesting because in the theatrical showing of One Hand Clapping, Paul did an intro. And in the intro, there's, he shows a picture of himself with David Litchfield. And he said, so David Litchfield was a director, so he was obviously the right guy to shoot this. But David Litchfield was not a director. And this is the first thing he ever did with film. He was a photographer and he ran an arts magazine um, that featured a bunch of Linda's photographs. And so through that, he and Paul and Linda became friends. And it was right as his magazine was tanking that Paul called up and said, how would you like to shoot this thing? So he said, yeah, sure. Um, he decided to shoot it on Umatic video. Um, it was the only video format really uh, available at the time. I mean, VHS and beta weren't out yet, I don't think. And, uh, and, Umatic, uh, the reason you would want to do it on video is because if you're doing it for the reason Paul wanted to do it, 
that is to see the bands working, then you want to maybe between takes stop and have a look at how it looks. And if you're doing it on film, that's not going to happen. You know, you, you could go see the daily rushes at the end of the day, but, uh, but video is far more convenient for that. So they did it on Umatic. And the problem was that later on, Litchfield came up with this idea of, you know, we could make this a documentary about Wings in the studio, you know, doing some of the favorites and whatever, because they're not really working on new material. Um, although Junior's Farm was in there and they'd already had recorded Junior's Farm, but there was more work to do on Junior's Farm. Anyway, um, I digress. Uh, so Litchfield decided to do it, to, to propose doing it as a documentary, which sounded good to Paul. The problem was you can't edit Umatic video. So they had to transfer the Umatic video to film, and edit the film, and then I think transferred it back to video. but. The quality that you saw in the theater, that's, mm. you know, it's, it's, it just sort of lost a lot of quality in those transfers. And um, it's possible that the, the, the Umatic originals were not amazing anyway. I'm not sure, but because uh, I haven't seen them. Um, but, you know, the thing is, I had been wondering how it would look in the theater because you'd think if Paul is bringing something out for public showings in theaters, you would expect it to be better quality. I mean, it, it wasn't absolutely awful quality, but it wasn't kind of the sharp video that we're yeah. used to seeing, you know, in the theater and even on, on screen or on DVDs, and Blu-rays now. Um, and I think they probably tried to do what they could do with it, because if you noticed at the very end, the 2024 credits went by very fast, but mm -hmm. Wingnut Films was yes. listed. <laughs> and, you know, if, if there's one thing we know about Wingnut Films is that they can make stuff that doesn't look good look great and sound great. Um, so they probably worked on it a bit. But um, but anyway, so that's the setup for one hand clapping. Okay, and I'll send it back to you guys. Now we've seen a lot of this through the years, clips here, a clip there, but never as you know as a complete. And it's actually not complete. What we're seeing isn't even. No, but but it is the complete. I, I should point out that there are several bootleg DVDs. Um, of the whole thing. Um, and the best one, the best one is on a label called Yellow Cow. Yellow Cow has the complete thing that we saw in the theater, plus they have restored Junior's Farm to the lineup, which was not in the theater. Um, also, what the Yellow Cow version has is two soundtracks. One, all the songs in stereo with no voiceover. And track two is the whole production in mono with the voiceovers. Um, so, you know, plus it has a bonus at the end. It has a, a, a uh, This Is Your Life, John Conte, who was a, a boxer, a Liverpool-based born boxer that Paul was a fan of and friends with. And, and so they were doing that where they'd set up a thing where uh, John Conte came to visit Paul in the studio ostensibly for some sort of a photo session that Linda was going to shoot. Um, and when he gets there, it's like, John Conte, this is your life, you know? So, uh, so that's a, a, a bonus track on the Yellow Cow TVD. So if you um, want to have your very own copy of One Hand Clapping pending any release by Paul, that's the one to go for. Yellow but, Cow? Yellow cow. What um. What I also want, and not that I found it interesting, this I guess because I always thought of the two, the main indoor sessions at Abbey Road, and then Paul going out to the backyard for some acoustic stuff one afternoon, and always thought of that as just being part of the full one hand clapping package. But you bought the uh, now now again I <laughs> I forget. The backyard sessions, you're getting on seven-inch single on the vinyl? 
Well, we got I a believe. few tracks of the backyard, yeah. Uh, so it's they're treated like bonus tracks on the physical album. And in the uh, theatrical sh screening, one hand clapping ends. Paul pops in and says, wait, there's more. I did this. And as a like a tag on is the uh, the backyard, as it's called, like almost like a little mini film of just Paul acoustic. When that's not incomplete, that's com incomplete. That's right. Right. Because there's some stuff missing from that, that they uh, uh, what song country do is country country dreamer or something. At least one song, think, I think. I wrote it down here. Well, first of all, between both what's on the vinyl and what's what we saw in the theater is both of them are not complete he did something like almost a half hour's worth of music but um the one that's on the vinyl is blackpool honey flight rock peggy sue <clears throat> peggy sue i'm gonna love you too country dreamer and blackbird now the i one, think yeah i wrote the songs down as i was watching the film just to compare yeah and i think that was the same thing that he that we see in the film it's not exactly the same thing as what's on no no uh blackpool 20 flight rock peggy sue i'm gonna love you too sweet six sweet little 16. right that's the film yeah so sweet little 16 is not on the vinyl okay okay and country dreamer and blackbird are not in the video in the theater that we saw that's right okay but there's other songs that he did too <laughs> that are not on either on either right like i mentioned only uh, there's a couple of elvis presley songs loving you and we're gonna move um those two songs which were really outstanding performances especially we're gonna move i um the one section in the movie that i don't ever recall seeing was that brief part with Howie Casey on sex mm -hmm. um on Blackbird uh -huh. uh, <laughs> Bluebird that I don't remember ever seeing that before but everything else in pieces I think I've seen through the years yeah well you know I got to tell you my experience in watching this video um what I found really interesting is that there were times when Whoever who was in the front of the camera, and usually it was Paul, his picture would be f pretty much clear. Whatever was behind him was blurry. Like in the very beginning of the film, Paul's singing and Linda's behind him. Linda looks very blurry behind him. You know, I didn't know if that was for, you know, artistic effect of any kind. Uh, but quite a lot of the film was blurry to me. It wasn't... Mm -hmm. It's more like, you know, this is a, a glorified bootleg on video and it's the audio that's really outstanding because the sound of the audio is just amazing. And we said that when the when the CD came out, mm -hmm. one hand clapping, it's just and the performance is fantastic. That's oh, what yeah. it's the whole the whole film is the performance and the sound quality of the audio. And I think um, it's a good thing for Jeff. I think it will help restore his, um, uh, you know, reputation in a way because since he was there so short and uh, because of the tensions which were sort of known, you know, people sort of write him off as just a, a, a short-lived member of Wings. But but this was a really good performance, including his performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get to see him drumming. Uh, you know it's it, it, it's a good thing he's it, it sort of shows what he could do and it's also very interesting that when paul does his introduction at the very start of the film you don't stop to think about it but paul says you know that linda and denny and jimmy are not here three-fifths of that band are no longer yeah. alive, and it's just paul and jeff Britton out of that lineup mm. I mean, you know it, but it's still shocking when you think of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed seeing because you don't tend to get to see Wings like we've now all these years later have seen the Beatles in the studio and the Get Back film, of course, uh, uh, Treasure Trove. 
but getting to getting to watch and see how you know the guitar parts that denny would play that i would hear on the record all these years and oh okay denny was doing that that was pretty i always thought that i always liked that riff and that's denny and seeing linda uh you know the reputation of linda as a musician is is makes you think gee i wonder if who was playing all these keyboard bits must have been someone else no linda was there linda had the mellotron uh there's a you hear at one point um i forget what song it's used on and then one camera angle linda's not playing she's just harmonizing but she's sitting behind the, the bank of keyboards and you sort of see the cabinet and it's it's a mellotron cabinet and it uh i was like that's very cool i just don't picture uh you know linda having the gear all around her and she did and she was right in there doing her thing and um it's it just it's just a great fly on the wall uh quality aside i wasn't expecting much the quality was exactly what i was expecting it's what we've seen for the most part blown up um and even on the on the big screen it actually helped it just it didn't take away for me at least didn't take anything away from it um uh and and like you said we get we've gained an appreciation for this lineup mainly for jeff Britton. you know we've known joe english we know denny denny Sawa and steve steve holly uh and their abilities as drummers but you, all we really had was junior's farm and uh, you know a couple of things on venus and mars and the country mm -hmm. ham single uh to really uh jeff Britton. but uh this kind of like is an education for wings fans getting to a new look on this short-lived lineup. Uh, I, I hope it, I would, you mentioned there's no mention yet as of yet a physical release. I mean, if there's ever something that is meant to end up on Blu-ray and DVD is this. And, and we know that there's material to add on as bonus. A lot of stuff left off other takes songs not on there. There was the one thing I remembered when he performed it i was like that's right i remember this when he does peggy sue that that was in the uh, documentary the paul mccartney special which came out straight to vhs in 1986 i believe because it was when press to play came out and there was that one clip of paul outside playing peggy sue and um so that kind of like i see now that's that part of history now it's explained it was a backyard of Abbey Road. There's a couple of things I got to say that kind of bother me about uh, this film. And that is, first of all, other than Paul, I had a lot of trouble understanding what the other members were saying when they spoke. Yeah, yeah. It needed subtitles. <laughs> yeah. And um, there is one glaring mistake <laughs> in this film. And that is that when Paul's at the piano and um he performs the song that he wrote for peggy lee let's love mm. later on you hear him talking about meeting with peggy lee and saying i'm going to write you a song and then it goes into um i'll give you a ring so that audio clip should have been placed right before let's love and they never corrected that um there's more <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us if anything Okay, so all story about, you know, I was going to have dinner with Peggy Lee in London, and so I decided to bring a bottle of champagne, uh, a song instead of a bottle of champagne. Yeah. Totally made up. Because <laughs> by the time Paul had dinner with Peggy Lee in London, Peggy Lee had already recorded the song or the first version of the song in LA and brought it with her and gave it to him. So actually she gave him <laughs> the song um, rather than the other way around. But uh, obviously he had gotten the song to her long before this dinner in London. Um, he listened to, the, to her recording of the song and was not crazy about it. And oh. then went into the studio recorded his own backing track including orchestration and on his way to nashville went to la 
did this the session with Peggy Lee, where basically she just added her vocal to his backing track, which was also not the way she liked to work. She liked to work in the studio with the musicians playing. Um, but it's Paul and the and it's gonna be the I think title track of the album mm -hmm. and the first and the, the right. album opening track as well. And so she didn't have much choice. Um, so she sang it and, you know, they did a press conference, a press thing, you know, I guess a press conference afterwards and a little bit of playing and uh, went, in, went in and uh, played the song for the press. Um, but the whole story about I thought I'd bring her a song instead of a bottle of champagne, it's it's like the, you know, George Martin story about how someone else was going <laughs> to, who else can we get to sing Live and Let Die? You know, it's it just isn't what happened. Anyway, nice story, though. It's a great yeah. story. All I mean, it sounds, it sounds like Paul's memory of the whole thing just was clouded. He got things twisted so, up in reverse. Or maybe he intended to bring so champagne. In 1974, only a few months after the occurrences. So, oh, I that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when when Paul was at the piano in one hand clapping, doing "Let's Love," he had already finished recording with Peggy Lee. Oh yeah. That, okay. That, that was finished before Nashville. On the pretty much on the way to Nashville, it was not really on the way from London to you know, go. See, he, he he sings this other part in "Let's Love" that was not part of the Peggy Lee recording. Hmm. So it's weird. <laughs> Isn't there um, my notes here? I put. Are you talking about the? Um, you know, I I've jotted it down in while I was watching the film on my phone. And write, wrote it down as "Let's Love All of You." All of you is a whole other song. Okay, all right. I thought maybe that was because that was one I kind of was a little fuzzy on, and I had to look it up. If anyone saw me in the theater doing research while I'm watching the film, uh, just refreshing my memory on on uh, on uh, the, the the list of songs that he did. I love. I still love, and I didn't know it until we first. Um, I guess when the album was coming out. Um, Hearing I'll Give You a Ring in the context of this material from 74 right. yeah. and how fully fleshed out it was. It's pretty much exactly what he ended up recording uh, years later for the single. Um, but he, seeing that that was something that was sitting around. And uh, also uh, another thing that I always thought was a little weird, especially when he then talked about having written the song when he was a teenager, is Suicide. Uh, while a nice melody, it seems like an awfully odd song, lyrically, for someone like Frank Sinatra to record. And I'm thinking, you wrote that when you were a teenager, Paul? What was going on that night? You know, it's just, you know, I call it suicide. Jeez. <laughs> wow. But that's, it still strikes me as kind of an odd thing to think that a Tony Bennett, a Frank Sinatra would uh, would would record suicide yeah it may be the only song that's ever been written that has the word ruinide in it what now what is that i don't <laughs> i thought the guy had bad Thought vision ruin. ruin eyes i can't I, see i might as well commit suicide he couldn't seriously be thinking that frank would record that <laughs> frank instead preferred glasses Sorry, never yes. mind. <laughs> but getting back to all of you, that's a great song. I don't know why he didn't do a studio version of that on one of the Wings albums at the time, or later on, like he brought back "I'll Give You a Ring," mm -hmm. or "Dig It Up for uh, for Kisses on the Bottom." Yeah, that fit. It's like I, I mentioned um, when he was promoting "Run Devil Run," and he was on one of the British talk shows why can't i remember the name of the host was it terry wogan or the other one but he he made up this song well he, he had written this song when he was in new york looking out the window over central park and it's very much like a standard that would have fit on kisses on the bottom or like all of you parkinson parkinson i never remember okay thank you but yeah he also does the long winding road on there great version of it just him on the piano but yeah 
the song that he just made up. It's just, that could have worked. Why didn't he do something with that? You know, he did that. He it's one of his party tricks, actually. Um, he did that one uh, at Parkinson uh, earlier uh, with Melvin Bragg. He was showing how he writes songs and uh, wrote a song called, you know, Melvin Bragg. And and he's talking, okay, so, you know, maybe I can have um, uh, looking in the mirror. Melvin's looking in the mirror. No, but what if it's, you know, and he's showing how he, you know, will change things on the way. So there's that. And there was also one he did, uh, on one of those MTV or VH1 live interviews uh, where he... Oh, the one with John Fugel saying. Yeah, yeah. He made up a song on the spot. Right. And everybody so, sang along. he can do. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not a surprise, actually, is it? <laughs> but uh, no, but the song on Parkinson was, was developed, you know? Yeah. He didn't just make it up on the spot there. Yeah, yeah. So, and another thing about the this film is that I get confused. I know that you said when just now earlier, and when Adrian Sinclair was was on the show, that he had no intention of releasing this at all. And then you said that maybe it could be a documentary. Well, it has a documentary feel when every single member gets to say something. But yet, probably half this film is Paul alone at the piano. So you don't feel like it's a band as much if the whole thing was the band rehearsing or maybe a couple of songs at the piano but it seemed like there was a lot of paul alone mm -hmm. right i mean paul did the same day he did the backyard session he did another session at the piano inside uh yeah. the road. and uh the very first day of one hand clapping session or what would become the one hand clapping sessions uh when they were basically setting up for camera and stuff like that he also did on his own um so there there was a lot of paul but there also is a ton of band stuff so uh you know what i think they should do <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, uh if they put this out on dvd or blu-ray is put out this version fine and then you know, as a sort of tail wagging the dog bonus track section, they should make a new version with as much as they possibly can of the band stuff and then the backyard stuff and Paul Solo at the piano stuff. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just get the best takes of everything because they did so much more than 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 we see in the film. Um, right. And, you know... And and I also have heard that, I mean, even after David Litchfield died, apparently they uh, found in uh, in his house um, more of the, uh, maybe the original Umatics or, you know, whatever. If, if that's the case, then they have a lot more stuff and they have it in its original form. They could just take the, you know, the, 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 the music was recorded at Abbey Road on their multi-track equipment so you could just take that music add it to the film and uh, and make a new version of one hand clapping that would have a lot more in it and i think that would be the way to go i mean i, I think it should also include this version because this version is the historical version mm -hmm. that, you mm. know that litchfield edited to you know try to sell to the bbc as a documentary but the bbc looked at the quality and they said are you out of your mind can't broadcast this you know yeah. so it sat on the shelf all these years when you say there was a lot of other material other songs that they touched on that they didn't yeah you know like maybe anything from like wildlife or ram or um i don't remember offhand i could look it up and <laughs> well it's just interesting. when the when the album and the cd came out we didn't know there was sally g on there an acoustic sally g we didn't know there was this other version of tomorrow Mm -hmm. slowed down short version it's yeah, nice yeah. to have those snippets of beatles songs in there yeah, so yeah. There, that's only what was released so yeah all right 
So let's hope we get uh, like a, a video. Let's hope we get the DVD Blu-ray of One Hand Clapping to go with the the uh, the album that came out earlier this year. Uh, and I guess that has it. I think we actually had both hands clapping there <laughs> for a while. But uh, so now we have that. It seems to be like when it, when it rains, it pours. All of these uh, cinematic events. One hand clapping. We've seen. Uh, Midas Man coming now. We understand it's going to be streaming. Um, we've got the uh, the John two John and Yoko documentaries actually. Yes. Uh, and um, I mentioned Midas Man. And am I forgetting one Things more? Oh, what was that, Alan? Alan? Things we said today. Oh right. Yeah, we oh, don't. Oh yeah, that that but... one with the name they robbed from us. Uh, but there's a, it just seems to be a convergence of these of these um films these video specials so i'm looking forward to uh what's next you know yeah, for one hand clapping kind of odd um as uh, for them to use that as the title um seeing as it's about the 1965 shea stadium concert when i don't think things we said today was in the set anymore in 1965 so why Obviously, they're just capitalizing on our popularity, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, it's just clear. In fact, yeah, it's definite. They're doing it so that they can get on our show with us. Right, right, right. Say they were on things we said. <laughs> right. Exactly. All right, so should we put a wrap? You want to go around and, and uh, fill the folks in on what crazy things we've been doing? Okay. So with, the, so with uh, Alan, we know... Um, the publish the uh, the publishing dates coming up. Where, where now? What is going on in the McCartney Legacy world now? As we're just months away from uh, publishing. Um, don't really know. We uh, have read it now. I think three or four times. You know, back from the publisher with questions and whatever. And uh, at this point now, the latest things we've heard from them are about you know the back cover and uh, various illustrations and the inside covers. You remember last time we had the strawberry from Paul strawberry shirt. I think, I think he called it a strawberry field shirt actually, um, which, uh, you know, confused some people since they associate strawberries with John, but it was Paul's shirt that he wore on a, uh, I think top of the pops performance. Um, so we thought we would use that design for, for volume two. We have something else. I don't know if I should keep it a surprise or, uh, or say it, but. Uh, blueberries. Hmm? Um, blueberries. Um, whose idea actually, you, Adrian, the publisher, on the artwork and the colored covers? I've never asked you that. And, and was that done knowing that there would be future editions for identification purposes, a unique color for each book? Um, you know, probably we didn't really talk about it, but when the, when they did the first book, they showed us a bunch of different colors and my favorite color is red. So I voted for red and everyone seemed to agree. So that was red. And then, then when this, this one came up, they said, okay, what color should we do it? And I think we all agreed it should be blue. Um, not sure what the future ones will be. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was settled long ago. Um, we've just now been doing, you know, other, you know, other illustration things. And Adrian is really in charge of the illustrations, basically, you know, he's, he's much more visually oriented and picture oriented than I am, you know, being a, a video director. Um, and, uh, you know, and also I'm, I'm like, I'm one of these guys who will buy a book. And if it has a picture section, I'll quickly flip through the picture section and say, yeah, I've seen that. Haven't seen that. That's nice. One. And then read the book, because to me, the text is really the most important thing. But, um, you know, with a Adrian also uh, felt, I mean, they gave us the choice and, and we all kind of agreed that the picture should be interspersed with the text. Um, but in both cases, the publishers sort of put the pictures, um, you know, uh, 
the second one they did a much better job uh the the first one they originally the pictures were all at random and we had to have them all moved to different places the second volume there was only a, a, there were a couple of instances of that um but mainly the pictures were where we wanted them so so that's you know that's the kind that's the kind of stuff we've been doing you know it's uh you know and also just sort of reading it again changing certain things um you know with a project like this all the time there's going to be some last in minute information that comes uh mm -hmm. i mean in fact when, when we turned the book in one hand clapping hadn't been released even on uh disc on on cd uh so we had to add that to the discography <laughs> kind of thing uh and then when we did add it it hadn't been announced as the, the the backyard stuff hadn't been announced as being available for streaming. It was only going to be in the vinyl edition of the album. So we had it listed that way and we had mm -hmm. to change that. So we're just hoping that for the next couple of months, he doesn't do anything else that has to do with the 1974 through 1980 period so that we can just put out the book in peace. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, revise it uh, on the next edition if necessary. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's was any thought ever given to making like an a, a, uh, an edition of the book, like you know, like the kind I used to love when I was younger, like they would have a you could have the connect the dots section in the middle or coloring pages or you know big words for people like me. I'm just kidding. Um, the inside covers are a little like that, but not exactly. <laughs> not connect the dots, but they're. I'm thinking like highlights for children's version of the McCartney legacy for people like me. Anyway, I'll tell you what it is. Adrian can hassle me later for revealing, but um, the inside covers this time, what Adrian has done is, you know, when he put out Thrillington, now the recording <laughs> of Thrillington, of course, was in volume one, but it didn't come out until the period we're covering. Um, hmm both originally and then again right before the release of the album paul took out like dozens of these little ads personal ads in british publications you know um percy thrillington would like to announce that he will be at this you know ball on sunday or you know percy thrillington says that you know you should uh, take a bath regularly whatever the hell it was you know <laughs> all of these messages which were really kind of funny and so adrian has collected them all and we've the the inside covers are going to be all of these thrilling to oh nice cool <laughs> yeah i think it's a nice touch anyway Paul, okay. we really appreciate that <laughs> anyway yeah all right so uh, actually so we would started our our uh, uh, editors right yeah so i lost my train i threw it to you right alan yeah so I just get okay. my contact info and that's that you know. uh, yeah okay of course uh you know you can reach me on facebook either at alan cozen or uh alan cozen remixed and there is a mccartney legacy facebook page too that you should check into um and uh, like I, I said last time, you know, if we find out about uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or someone having the thing on sale, we always put the info there. So, uh, and we may end up posting, a, a, you know, features based on stuff in the book as it gets closer, um, as we did last time. Um, and you can contact all of us at Things We Said Today by emailing us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um, send us suggestions send us comments whatever you want send money well can't email money can you can actually <laughs> um yeah this is a uh, my version of the soupy sales thing i was um, just gonna say that <laughs> i actually saw that show <laughs> I'm sitting in my parents' bedroom watching the TV, and he says, you know, so go into your father's pocket and take out the wallet and take out these green things and send it to me. And I thought, 
can you say stuff like that? <laughs> and it turns out you can't. <laughs> or at least you can't in those days. And he got booted off the air. Poor Soupy. Anyway, um, we have uh, a Facebook page for the group too, the group meeting us, uh, which is Things We Said Today video podcast. Um, and Darren has finally zapped the original Things We Said Today page. Can't even remember what it was called. But so look for this logo. Yeah, that's our, our logo. And that's the logo that's on the official page. All other pages are defunct. Thank you. Okay. They have ceased to be. It is no more. They are X pages. <laughs> Reft of life, they rest in peace. <laughs> and can I remember that whole bit? <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, on my own uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, just did a new video, which turned out to be just great. Um, it's an idea that I've had for a while, which I was kind of hoping we would do, but we can always do it here as well. Um, it's an early versus later Beatles period show. And I invited Bruce Spicer on along with Al Sussman, who, of course, used to be a co-host on this show, and Walter Everett to discuss um, this topic. For a while, it's been bothering me <laughs> for a while. It's been decades that I've noticed that there doesn't seem to be as much appreciation for the early Beatles period uh, as the later period. And even if you take a look at the charts, and I know not everybody cares about the charts, you take a look at the Billboard album charts through the years, if any Beatles albums appear, it's either Abbey Road, maybe the White Album, rarely Sgt. Pepper. Um, you'll never find anything pre-1967 on the charts. And I'm not talking about when the box sets come out. You know, I'm just talking about regularly whatever's on the charts. Um, classic rock radio for the longest time barely plays anything pre-1967. In fact, classic rock radio, as Darren will note, has changed a lot where you barely hear any 60s and even a lot of the 70s is uh, trimmed down. Uh, it's like the 80s and up. But, uh, you know, to hear any early Beatles stuff, you either have to be listening to a Beatles show or there has to be a special reason. If there's any oldie station that you're lucky enough to find that still plays 60s music, let's almost forget about the 50s even. But, um, you know, you barely ever hear the early Beatles stuff. And why is that? Is the early music no, Ken. copy? What's that? You'd be interested to know. I had lunch this week with um, a guy who's actually one of our listeners, John Rarick. Hey, John, uh, who said that he prefers the early Beatles stuff. Okay. I've never heard anyone say that before, and but I thought of you when, <laughs> when we had that conversation. Well, one person wrote into my YouTube channel on this, uh, for this video, and said that these days he prefers the earlier period. And I'm not saying that the earlier period is better. It's just that I, I feel like it's it's been forgotten for the most part. Um I feel like the Beatles channel leans on the early stuff a little more. Really? Okay. I think, yeah, I think so. Well, you can't really go based on that. You know, that's a specialty channel. I'm talking about what, what's programmed to the general public. Oh, yeah. For the most part. And um, I also like to raise the question of, was there such a big difference between 1966 and 67 with the Beatles? I mean, Revolver is what led to Sgt. Pepper, and it's just, it's like a leaner version of Sgt. Pepper to me, production wise. You can see how Revolver, everything on Sgt. Pepper made sense after you listened to Revolver, but, right. you know, there seems to have been this dividing line for many years that 1967 was the year when everything changed. It was the start of uh, the album as a, a concept album, or it was the, the major art form. Hey, the albums the Beatles made before 1967 were solid albums. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not like all the great music start, started in 1967. <clears throat> so we had a, a long talk about this, and that's what that entire video is all about. So if you can, check it out at Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to the channel. My other um, podcast show, Talk More Talk, we're going to be doing a show just as we did on this one, discussing Ringo's tour. And also, one hand clapping the video, 
be nice to hear a different opinion from the other co-hosts that I have, Kid O'Toole, Joe Mayo, and Tom Hunyadi. Please subscribe to that channel. And um, for my radio show, Every Little Thing, you never get to see what's on my shirt here. This is my WFDU shirt. My show can be heard on WFDU as part of their weekly programming, but you can always listen to it um, in their archives uh, on their website, WFDU.FM. Just go to their archives page, type in every little thing, and they have the last two weeks worth of shows there, which each show they run and keep available for two weeks. It's the easiest way for you to, uh, to listen to the show. It's the only way you can listen on demand is on WFDU.FM. And don't forget my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, has Beatles trivia, where you can win one of ten great prizes. Still on the list is the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. I like how just Alan very cleverly puts the blue one right next to it. So you see it throughout the entire show. He doesn't just bring it right and shows it in the camera. It's there like like a subliminal thing. Very clever of Alan. You know, just, just wanted to point that out. So just to get you ready for the December 10th release date. Um, yeah, so if you can, go to KenMichaelsRadio.com. You have usually two weeks to uh, to send an answer or answers. If there's more than one that I need, there's Beatle games and Beatles trivia all the time. And uh, great prizes to be won. Books, audio, video on uh, on the website. Okay. Uh, and if you want to write to me, every little thing at att.net is my email address. Okay. Please write in with ideas for this show, for my video channel, and uh, for Talk More Talk if you want to. Subscribe to all of them. We're all one great big family. Don't push it. <laughs> and uh, as for me, WFUV is my home. Um, I'm on the air Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 till 4. And something that I never mention, actually, and probably it needs to be made clear, uh, even to, to hardcore WFUV listeners, Saturday afternoon games, games, Saturday afternoon shows for me do sometimes appear to be getting preempted because WFUV also broadcasts Fordham football. And uh, most of the games fall on Saturday afternoons. If I'm not mistaken, and I can never completely confidently get down uh, what's going on here, if you were to stream WFUV, the music keeps going. So while I say I'm there, and I know somebody recently asked me about this, I'm on the air 1 to 4 o'clock Saturday afternoons. You turn on 90.7 FM and there's a football game on. Well, it's actually also at WFUV.org. So, um, and the website's great, of course, if you're not in the tri-state area. Uh, so that's Monday through Friday night, uh, Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturdays 1 to 4. If you want to email me personally, uh, ddevivo at wfuv.org. I have two Facebook pages. Come by and send me a friend request on one or like or follow or whatever it is on the other page and we'll be in touch. And uh, WFUV is going to be fundraising. Just to throw it out there, if you want to support non-commercial public radio, uh, starting Tuesday, October 1st, our fall membership drive uh, kicks off and lasts till uh, Sunday, whatever Sunday is after the 1st. Um, so it's almost a week on air fund drive. My hours will change next week as a result of that on the air. And... And uh, also might as well mention WFUV's annual holiday benefit concert is, is called Holiday Cheer for FUV. And we have it every year. And this year, the 2024 uh, show is going to move to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn Paramount. Uh, we've been at the Beacon Theater in recent years in Manhattan, now at the Brooklyn Paramount, December 11th. And uh, performing is going to be the head and the heart. Margot Price, Barty Strange, and Infinity Song. And Adam Weiner from the band Low Cut Connie as well. And go to WFUV.org to find out more and find out about buying tickets for that. And I think that's all from me. And um, for Alan Cozen, for Ken Michaels, I want to thank everyone for watching things we said today. We'll be back a um, couple of weeks. We'll have a new show for you. 
and uh, hope you'll be out there with us. Take care, everyone. <laughs>